Welcome to Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. Today, we will continue our study through the book of Tyrus. Last week, we covered Tyrus chapter 1. Today, we're going to cover Tyrus chapter 2. If you miss any of our studies, you can go to my channel on YouTube. It's Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. Or you can go to our website. It's... Um, KUIM.org and all of our teachings are posted online. But before we continue, let's have a word of prayer together. Father God, we all agree today as touching this thing. I am praying for utterance, utterance to speak to your people today boldly as your own oracle. I am praying for the anointing, the anointing of your spirit that will anoint us today. Teach us today, guide us today, lead us into all the truth. Spirit of God, you are the great teacher. I am just a vessel. So I ask you to open the eyes, ears, hearts of everyone listening, wherever they're listening from tonight. Give to them what you want them to get out of today's teaching. Minister to them simultaneously. Help us to separate ourselves from the things that are not of God. That we will have understanding of spiritual things. Help us every day to be strong in our faith. Give us revelation knowledge, understanding. Let the light of the glorious gospel shine always in our part. We always propose to be doers, not hearers only. So we ask you, Holy Spirit of God, that it will help us be doers of the word of God. Heavenly Father, I thank you because the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that brings salvation has appeared to all men. This grace is teaching us to live a godly life. This grace is teaching us to overcome worldly lust and desires. This grace is teaching us today to live soberly and uh, righteously and godly. This grace is not a license to sin. But I thank you because by the power of your Holy Spirit, we will modify the deeds of the body. So that we can live that life, the life which Jesus Christ has given to us, to the full, till it overflows. So many things you have done, O oh Lord. So many things you are doing right now in our lives. And much more that you will do. Father, we will take no glory, but we will say all glory, honor, and magnification belongs to you. In the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said, Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. My good friends, welcome. I welcome everybody to today's teaching. We are going to cover Tyrus chapter 2 today. Like I said at the beginning, we already covered Tyrus chapter 1. So if you missed that teaching, go to uh, our website. and uh, Or you can go to the YouTube channel or even uh, SoundCloud. Uh, all of these teachings are available. I'm going to give you a summary of what uh, we covered so far. Um, the book of Tyrus, uh, we said, was written by Paul. Paul writing to Tyrus, uh, one of his prodigy. Uh, it was believed that um, Paul, at some point, was at Crete with Tyrus. So Paul left Tyrus at Crete. But while he was at Crete with Tyrus, he made some observations. He noticed that the Judaizers, which are the Jewish legalists, they were upsetting families. They were going around teaching people about the salvation of syncretism, which means they were telling people that are uh, Salvation is not complete until you add uh, 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 circumcision and uh, 
laws of Moses to it. So they said Jesus Christ is not enough. This is what they were teaching people. And Paul also noticed that they had a lot of moral challenges in this area at Crete. So when he left Crete, he wrote to Tyros, instructing Tyros to appoint leaders. Now, these leaders, he gave him the criteria to appoint them. This will be pastors or leaders or bishops. They are all interchangeable in the New Testament. Who, not only that they will, that not only that they know the word of God, not only that they understand the word of God, but they are doers. So they're living out the word of God every day. So he instructs Tyros to appoint leaders in every city where they have the church. And that's what uh, uh, we covered so far. So today we are going to just dive into chapter 2. And I'm going to read, uh, by the grace of God, I believe we should be able to cover this chapter tonight. It's a very short chapter. So, Tyros, chapter 2, verse 1. And I read, But as a few speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. What is he saying here? Remember, I told you about this Judaizers who's gone around teaching salvation of syncretism, pointing to the people that uh, if they want to be born again, they not only will they believe in Jesus Christ, but they have to also add circumcision to it. They have to keep the laws of Moses. So these Judaizers, Paul uh, told um Tyros to stop them, to rebuke them sharply. So now he turns around. In contrast, he tells Tyros what to teach the people. Remember what the Judaizers, they were teaching the people about uh, 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 salvation plus circumcision plus laws of Moses is the only way you can be saved. So, here, Paul turns around, and now he's telling Tyrus what to teach the people. He wants Tyrus now to teach the people the life of their doctrine. He wants Tyrus to teach the people to live a life that will be a reflection of sound doctrine. A life that will be a complete representation of the word of God. A life that will be uh, 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 according to their own confession. Which means if they say that we they are Christians, they ought to live out that life so that it will back up what they claimed or what they have confessed. So that's what Paul tells Tyrus now to teach the people. And he went along and he gave examples, choosing some age groups and uh, gender, just to tell Tyrus what to teach to these people. So we can see the first group that he talked about here is in verse 2. So I read verse 2, he says, that the older men may be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. He's talking about the older men now. I don't know the color for that old age. I don't know. So I'm not going to talk about that. But to the older men, he wants them to have a, a clear to think very clearly. And he wants them to be very, very respectful. He wants them to have sound doctrine. He wants them to understand the scriptures. He wants them to not be baby Christians. Now, he wants the other men to move from the stage of make 
to strong meat. Where they are no longer blown away by every wind of doctrine. He wants them to have a strong foundation. And this strong foundation can only come through the word of God. The knowledge of the word of God. Because the Bible says the entrance of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. So Paul writes to Timothy here what to teach the older men. He wants them to walk in love, which is the law that summarizes all the laws of Moses. One single law. To walk in love. To walk in love with your fellow men. He wants them to have patience. Now, patience, remember that patience and faith, they work hand in hand. As a matter of fact, when you run out of patience, you've come to the end of your faith. So he wants them to have patience. He wants them to understand the importance of patience. That when they go through tribulations and through trials, it is a way to work their patience. For James says, the trying of your faith works patient. He doesn't want them to give in or to give up when they have trials and tribulations. Knowing that this trial of their faith will, be, will bring about perseverance. Which is patience. So this is the instruction for the older men. Now we proceed in verse 3. It talks about now the older women. <laughs> so like I told you, he chose gender and also uh, different age groups. Just to give an example of how they should live. Now, remember here, observe here, that he's talking about how they live here. How they live. He's not talking about salvation here. Because he's already talking to people who are already saved. Paul wrote about the root of salvation as well as uh, the fruit of salvation in his epistles. For example, in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8, he says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not through works, lest any man should boast. Now he's talking about the root of salvation. For you to be saved, you don't have to add any works to it. Jesus Christ paid the ultimate price. So you don't come in with your works. You only come in with faith and you receive the grace. That grace is salvation which is given to everyone is available free of charge. But the St. Paul is writing here now to, to Tyros. Telling Tyros to teach the people about how they should live their lives. So someone will ask, why is he talking about works here? Now he's talking about the fruit of salvation. Remember, the root of salvation requires no work. But after you are born again, the same thing James wrote, faith without work is dead. So that salvation, that faith that you used when you got saved, Supposed to bear fruit. It has, it's supposed to have a corresponding action. If you say that I'm an apple tree, someone's supposed to see apple fruit in your tree. So, a, an evident token that you are saved is there gotta be some uh, fruit. We can see some reflection. We can see some things manifesting in terms of your behavior to prove that you are Saved, you are born again. So he's talking about how they will live their lives now. So that's what he's talking about. So in verse 3, I had to clear that out because I know in some people's mind, they will be like, I thought we are saved only by faith. Why is he talking about works here? So it's the same thing James talked about. Faith without work is dead. After you get saved, then there is, you are expected to bear fruit. 
Because the Holy Spirit, remember Jesus Christ said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whosoever remains in me will bear much fruit. Without me, you can do nothing. So as long as you are in Christ, you are expected to bear fruit. Fruits of righteousness. Fruits that will indicate that you are saved and that you are now in Christ. And remember, the Spirit of God gives you that uh, ability to bear this fruit. It's not on your own accord, on your own strength. The Spirit of God is going to be the one that will give you the grace, the ability to be able to bear this fruit. So don't panic and say, how am I going to bear fruit? Believe. And by the power of the Holy Ghost, you will bear fruit, even much fruit. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we proceed to verse 3. The other women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderous, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. So now it talks about the older women. Again, I don't know the age cut off. <laughs> so I let you figure that out. But it's encouraging them here to live a respectful life. It's encouraging them here to not be slanderous. Which means people who gossip a lot. Talking about other people, talking them down. Using them in their discussions. Is encouraging them here not to be addicted to wine. Now, he's talking about wine here, but at the time Paul wrote this epistle to Timothy, I'm sorry, Tyros. If I say Timothy in this teaching, I meant to say Tyros. <laughs> it is very, very common. So if you catch me saying Timothy here, <laughs> I meant to say Tyros. So, so the, the time when Paul wrote this, wine was a very common beverage for the reason that the water they had then was not clean. So they used a little wine to kill the bacteria so that uh, it does not cause uh, sickness or disease to them. But it's warning the women here, do not go past their use of just using a little wine for killing the bacteria in the water. Because remember, all things are lawful, Paul says. But I will not be put under the power of any one of them. People who became alcoholics started by only one sip of alcohol. So it's encouraging the women here, don't go beyond that boundary. Remember, there are certain things Bible doesn't tell us that shall not, that shall not. But if you want to know if that is good or bad for you, use this simple scripture. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are expedient. Which means you're going to ask yourself, if I engage in this behavior, is it going to expedite my work with Christ? Or is he going to hinder me? That will answer if you got to continue with that behavior or not. The second one is, all things are lawful, but I will not be put under the power of any. So ask your question, ask yourself this question before you engage in that behavior or that activity. Am I going to become a slave to this at some point? Remember, Addiction simply means that you are a slave to something. If you're, not, if, 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 if you're addicted to alcohol or to anything, any behavior, it simply means that you are now a slave to that. So if you are addicted to alcohol, means that you are now under the power of it. I've seen lives gone into ruin. Lives ruined because of alcoholism. So my simple advice or opinion is stay away completely if you don't have the power over it. Now, the last one is all things are lawful to me, but not all things are edifying. So ask yourself before you get into that activity, is this in edifying? Is he going to build me up? 
Is he going to beat the next person up? Is it going to be something that will tear down or something that will divide? So when you ask yourself these three questions, that will tell you whether you should engage in that activity or not. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So then wine was used as a treatment and it's encouraging the women not to engage in that wine activity to avoid uh, addiction. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that they should be teachers of good things. So women are also called to teach. To teach good things. That's what he's saying here. To teach the younger ones. To teach their children. To teach the people, colleagues at work. The ways of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 4. That they... Admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, just, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. So here is giving them the duty obligation to help the younger married women in their marriages. But before you can do this, remember that you got to be an example. Good means you are living out that uh, good marriage life before you can be a model to someone else or mentor someone else. Now, the question is this. Young girls Young married girls, my question is this, who are your friends? Who do you choose as friends? Do you choose those that are not yet married or those who are divorced as friends? Or do you choose the older women, those who are still in marriage, those who have lived out? their lives as examples. So it's a very clear instruction, young women, young ladies who are married, to look up to those who are older and who are still married. And the older ones, when they come to you, open your heart. Receive them as your little ones. Teach them, counsel them, guide them, and bring them up. As you live out that life in your own marriages. That's what he's talking about here. And then he says, to be discreet, chest, homemakers, good. And he says, obedient to their own husbands. Now, this is where so many women struggle. So many women misunderstand this right here. Obedient to their husbands. They think that the Bible is talking about gender uh, 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 inferiority. But that's not what it's talking about here. In the eyes, in the sight of Christ, both male and female are the same. He's not talking about gender inferiority. But what is he talking about here? No, he's talking about a man has a calling from God. To be the spiritual head. To be the overseer of the family affairs. So this is a duty that he did not call himself to do. It was given to him by God to act in this manner. So he's telling women here, wives, he's encouraging them here. He says, identify that this is a call from God for your husband." This is what God have asked them, had asked them to do. So, respond by submitting yourself so that you will help them out in this, in what God has called them to do. That's what he's saying here. And he says when you do it, you got to do it with all your heart. You're going to do it as a choice. 
something that you have decided to do, not out of compulsion or out of fear or pressure or constraint. But it says you're going to do it as unto the Lord. The Bible says, wives submit to your husband as unto the Lord. So you're not doing it for him, but as unto the Lord. So as soon as you have that at the back of your mind, that this is what God is asking you to do, then it comes to you easily and you can then fulfill that obligation. And man, you are called to love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave his life, gave his life for the church. So you can see that God did not give so many rules about marriage. To the man and to the woman, he gave only two laws. Only two. Can you see how simple the laws of God can be? He didn't make it complicated. Now, 20 rules to obey in marriage to have it work out. <laughs> God knows that you are not able to remember those 20 rules. He knows that you are not able even to understand them. But he made it very, very simple. So he gave the man one rule and he gave the woman one rule. To the man, he said, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And to the woman, he said, submit to your husband as unto the Lord. Now, these two things... When a, a woman sees or understands that he has the love of the husband, regardless, even when she does something wrong, that the love doesn't change. Then she has that even more courage to submit. And when a man sees that a uh, He's not being challenged every day. In every simple thing, he's being opposed by his wife. When a man senses that uh, that leadership which God has called him to be, that the woman is helping by submitting to that leadership, it even gives him more courage to love even more. So these two things, they work hand in hand. But remember, because that your husband is not loving, is not your own reason, wives, to say, I'm not going to submit to the leadership which God has called him. Remember, it says, submit as unto the Lord. And men, because your wife is not submitting, is not the reason why you should not love unconditionally because the Bible says love as Christ loved the church unconditionally. So once you do your own part and that person does his own part, things will flourish. Things will flourish. So stay on your own part. Don't deviate. Don't try to exchange roles. That's not the way God created it to be. That's why he made it too very simple. You play your own role here, and he plays his own role here, and things are superb. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory, hallelujah, amen. And he says that if they remain in this mannerism, wives, if they remain in this mannerism, he says, there will not be an occasion for unbelievers to blaspheme. Blaspheme is that for them to criticize Christianity or God and say, if they, if they say they are Christians and they're living this kind of married life, uh, why would I become a Christian? You see what I'm saying? Talking down because of the example that you show, because of the way that you live. So he says, if you live and conduct yourself in the way that God has prescribed here to live, you will not bring an occasion for the unbeliever to blaspheme God. That's what he's saying here. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we continue to verse 6. Likewise, 
Exhort the young men to be sober-minded. You see, it comes to the young men, it's only one, one rule. To be sober-minded, which means to be, to have self-control. God knows what they need, our teenagers. Self-control. Not giving in to youthful exuberance or peer pressure. So pastors, teachers, parents, encourage your teenagers not to give in to youthful exuberance, to peer pressure, to flee from moral, sexual immorality. There is a huge sexual gravitational pull going on a lot among the teenagers. Remember Paul writing to Timothy says, flee youthful lust. Now, these sexual immoralities and the things that are going on among the youth, these things are even worse today because of technology. Technology is even making it harder. Technology like telephones, computers. Now, they can access any website, they can access any, any information, social media, just by clicking, just a click on the phone or in the computer. And there are people who are even making it worse. These are the people who are saturating social media, internet, websites with materials and videos full of pornography, full of obscenities, full of violence. Materials that are devoured of uh, 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 moral integrity. For you, it is a business. For you, it is a way to profit. For you, it is an entertainment. But you know what I see? I see destruction gone on rampage. I see a rendezvous of broken humanity. I see a propagation of lasciviousness and licentiousness. For these are the things that are destroying the teenagers. The future leaders of our nations. Remember Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 17 verse 1, he was talking to his disciples. And he says, offenses will come, stumbling will come, enticement to sin will come, temptations to sin will come. He says, but woe unto him through whom these things will come. He says, it will be better for that person that a male stone is tied on that one's neck and that one is cast into the sea than he that will cause one of these little ones to stumble. The Lord is not happy about it. But you, the one that is doing this, if I'm talking to you, it's not too late. You can repent today. We can start by taking down these materials from online. Take them down. And then receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. Be born again. And he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. As east is far from the west, he will not remember these iniquities anymore. And he will now give you the wisdom to prosper in godly way and not through these devices. I fear for our youth. I fear for the nations of the world. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face 
and turn away from their evil ways. Then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their nations. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach unto people. Sin is a reproach unto a people. In verse 7, we continue. In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing integrity. Reverence. Incorru incorruptibility. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. That one who is an opponent may be ashamed. Having nothing evil to say of you. So Paul turns right now to Tyros. And he tells Tyros to be an example himself. Tyros here now is the one teaching them. But Paul tells him, I want you to live that life that you teach them. I want you to be an epistle that will be written in their heart. A pistol that they will look at your lifestyle and they will be encouraged to even listen to you more. Remember David when he sang with Bathsheba. Nathan the prophet came to him and gave him a parable. He says, Is a man in your kingdom. Who had one little, one lamb, one single lamb. This lamb is so dear to him that this lamb will eat in, on, in his table. So precious. Treated this lamb as a family. That was the only thing he got. But he says, that was a rich man in your kingdom. He had so much. But he, one day he got a visitor. Then the visitor showed up. He asked his servants to go and get that one man's lamb. The only one he got. And he took that lamb from that man and killed that lamb and gave, it, gave that lamb to his uh, visitor. And when David heard of this, he said, that man must die. He deserves to die. And Nathan turned around and said, David, you are that man. And he pronounced judgment over him. The child that will be born will, will die. You will not die, David, but your household will, sword will never depart from your house. And he said to him in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 14, he says, However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, you have opened the door for criticisms, for the enemies of God to talk down on God, to mock God, to say, if this is the way your people behave, I don't want to be any of yours. So he's telling Tyros here, Tyros, live by example. Do not bring an occasion for unbelievers to mock Christianity or mock God. That's what he's saying here. And we proceed in verse 9. He says, Exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters. To be well pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adore the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. So now he's talking about uh, born slaves, born servants. Remember when Paul was writing this, they had slaves, they have servants. But he's talking about the born one here, which is a servant by choice. One who 
chose to be a servant. Even after they have paid off their debt, they say, I'm going to continue to serve this man. I'm going to be forever a slave or a servant done to this man. But if we relate that to our modern system, it will be relationship between employees and employer and employees. So now he's talking about um, employees, Christian employees. Remember that when you go to work in a place, you chose to work in that place. It is not by force. Nobody compelled you or forced you to go work in that place. It's a choice you made that you want to work in that place. So he's giving them now, he says, when you show up in that place, before I talk on this, before I speak on this, let me give you two scriptures. That if you are a Christian worker, an employee, if you have these two scriptures at the back of your mind, you will be an epistle of Christ in that place through your mannerism. Let me give you that and before I talk about it. In Colossians chapter 2, chapter 3, verse 23, he says, And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to man. The second one is this. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 7. Serve with good will as to the Lord and not man. If you have these scriptures at the back of your mind, you will be a good representative of Christ at your workplace. He's telling us here, he says, employees, you ought to show up at work happy, ready to work. You gotta show up there as you are working for Christ, not for men. Because promotion does not come from the east nor from the west, nor from the south. He says God is the one that will give promotion. He will demote one and then he will promote another. He says you don't have to walk only when people are looking at you, when the supervisor is around, when the manager is around, you put in your best. But when nobody's there, then you change the attitude. He says you got to show up on time and make the workplace not a place of gossip. Be productive. He talks about pilfering here. Pilfering means to steal. It's not a place where you take a little supplies to go home and say, there's a big company, you know, it's not going to affect them. No. He says, you got to work as if Christ is standing right in front of you. Give it all your best. Ask the Holy Spirit to empower you to give his wisdom and direction and light to represent Christ in that place of work. Now, when people see the way you work, when they see your manners and your attitude, it will bring them to come to you. And they will say, there is something different about you. What is that place? Now we bring an occasion for you to preach Christ to them and perhaps win some for Christ. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This got to be our attitude at our workplaces if we are Christians. Now... We proceed, we are now in verse 11, making good progress today. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to finish on time, so we will, I promise, we will. In verse 11, he says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. So, Paul now is writing to Timothy. He's talking about grace. He says, the grace of God that brings salvation. Remember what I said earlier. There is 
root of salvation and there is fruit of salvation. So he begins here with the root of salvation, which is grace. You are saved by grace alone, through faith alone. No works, no self-righteousness, no personal merits. It is only by grace that you are saved. And he says this grace, which means this grace, you are saved by grace, through grace you are saved. Now he says, he's teaching you something. Now he goes to the fruit of salvation. Like James says, faith without works is dead. So he's telling you here now, if you are saved, if you are born again, you are born again by faith alone in the grace, which is the unmerited favor of our Lord Jesus Christ. What he did for us, he's a vicarious atonement. He says, that's how you are saved. But after you are saved, he says, there is an expectation that will come, which will be seen by the way you live. That way you live should not be according to the word, according to worldly lust. It should not be ungodliness. But it tells you the expectation, what the fruit should be. It says that fruit should be, you got to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present time. Remember that the grace of God empowers you. When you got born again, the Spirit of God recreated your spirit. That day, the Spirit of God moves in you. That day you got born again. The Spirit of God moved in you. And now He empowers you to live this kind of life that we are talking about here now. Godly life. Grace of God is not a license to sin, as many people will think. Because they know a little bit of scriptures to be very dangerous with them. So some of them will say, they will quote the scripture. For we are saying abounded, grace even abounded more. This is the excuse they are giving for their sinning. That the grace of God will cover them. But he's telling us here is the opposite. That the grace of God teaches us to live a godly life. And this godly life that you're going to live is not going to be on your, by your own power. It's going to be the power of the Holy Ghost. Remember the power of the Spirit of God. The Bible tells us that the, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead in Ephesians chapter 1 says, This power now is residence in you. Now, what is the power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead? In Romans chapter 8, 11, the Bible tells us, If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, him that raised Christ up from the dead will also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwells in you. So it's the Holy Spirit that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead. And he says, this power of the Holy Ghost is in you now to help you accomplish this lifestyle. Remember that if we, by the Spirit of God, modify the deeds of this body, we will live life, the life that Christ has called us to live. So it's by the Spirit of God that you are able to live this kind of life that he's talking about here. Before you were born again, you couldn't. Are you hearing me, my friend? The Bible says we were dead in our trespasses. We were by nature children of wrath. You couldn't. It was impossible because you were under the dominion of Satan. He was in charge. Your spirit was separated from God. He was there. He, had, he, 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 he was in charge of you. Remember the Bible says in meekness, instructing those who oppose themselves. 
For God, for adventure, we grant them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth so that they will recover themselves from the snail of the devil who has taken them captivity against their own will. These are the ones before you were born again, you were taken into captivity against your own will. Satan took you captive. He took you captive. And the Bible tells us again in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, whom the God of this world has blinded the mind of them that believe not. Lee the light of the gospel, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, who is the image of God should shine upon them. The whole world is under the influence of the evil one. So you have no power before you were born again. But after you were born again, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God now empowers you to live that life. To live the life of a Christian. To bear fruit. Fruits that can abide. Fruits that can be seen. Knowing that Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slave of sin. Romans chapter 6 verse 6. So you see here, this is the empowerment of the Holy Ghost. How shall we who are dead to sin live longer anymore therein? It is not by might, not by power, not by strength, but by the power of the Holy Ghost that you were able to live this life that he has called you to live. The life that will always bear fruit. Fruit of righteousness. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we continue in verse 13. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearance of our, our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous, zealous for good works. So, it says, while you are doing this, you are living a godly life. You are looking for the blessed hope of the church, which is the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the Bible says, in a moment, in a twinkle of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ will be raised incorruptible, and we all shall be changed. He says, and this corruption will put on incorruptible, and this mortal will put on immortality. So he's talking about the rapture of the church. He says, while because we have it at the back of our mind that Jesus Christ is coming back very soon, that his coming back is imminent. He says this will encourage us even to yield more to the Spirit of God so that we'll be able to live a godly life. He said this is a hope for us. This will be a motivation for us, knowing that Jesus Christ is coming back very soon. That we who are alive and still remain will be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we be with him forever and ever. That's what he's talking about here. See, the hope, the, 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 the knowledge, the confidence by faith that Jesus Christ is coming back very soon, he said it will motivate us even more to live a life of godliness. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, and now he says, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. So, he gives you here now 
the reason why you can live a godly life. Like I said a few minutes ago, if you were not born again, you couldn't live this godly life. But he's telling us here, because of what Jesus Christ did, because he brought salvation to us, and now once you are born again, he empowers you now by his Holy Spirit to be able to live this life. Because you couldn't live this kind of life before you were born again. So he says, don't worry. Do not panic. Don't go into emotional depression. Thinking about how am I going to live this kind of life. He says, by faith, trust the Holy Spirit of God. Remember, he is in you right now. If you're born again, to lead you into all the truth. To show you the things yet to come. He is your comforter, your advocate, your helper, your strengthener. The one that takes hold together with you against the afflictions, the trials, the tribulations of this world. The one that makes you a victor, a success, a wonder to this generation. It is the Spirit of God. So he said, don't fear. The Spirit of God is in you and he's going to empower you to be able to live this kind of life. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory, hallelujah, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Baruch Hashem Adonai. Now in verse 15, which is the last verse, Paul tells Titus, he says, Speak these things, exalt and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. So he says, teach these things. Encourage people, exhort them in their faith, through your teachings, through the word of God. Encourage them, build them up through the word of God. But he says, don't forget to rebuke. Which means, if you see any sign of false teaching, wrong doctrine, in that place that you have been called and given authority as a pastor or an overseer, he says, do not hesitate to rebuke. Stop that teaching. Stop it right away. Confront the one who is doing that. Speak to them in love and make the necessary correction. For a little leaven will leaven the whole lump if it is left unattended. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. My good friends, I have come to the end of today's teaching. If you under the sound of my voice, wherever you are in the world, and you are not yet born again, another golden opportunity has come. Maybe you are a member of a church, but you are not born again because so many church members are not born again for the simple reason they don't understand what it means to be born again. Nobody has ever brought that to their own understanding. To them, the thing that if you're a member of a church, if you're a registered member of a church and you are baptized in water, then you are born again. But the Bible says that is not so. You can be baptized in water and die and go to hell. You can be a member of a church and die and go to hell. But what is it to be born again? The Bible tells us. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth, Lord Jesus Christ, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. To be born again means that you believe in what Jesus Christ did for you. That he died in your place. God raised him from the dead. And now... He is seated at the right hand of the Father. So you ask him to come into your life. Be your Lord and your Savior. And you begin a relationship with him. Now you put aside your own self-righteousness, your own works, your own goodness. Put them aside and depend 100% on what Jesus Christ did for you for salvation. That's what it means to be born again. But there is no other way you can do this. 
Jesus Christ says he is the only way, the truth, and the life. No one will come to the Father but by him. So you can only come by what he did for you. Not through your own goodness or your own merits. No. Put them aside. And you must be born again because he tells Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. For there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved except the name of Jesus Christ. Now, there are so many religions in the world. They think that all roads lead to salvation, to, 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 to God. They say we serve the same God. The only difference is the way we approach him. But that is not true. The Bible tells us that if you reject Jesus Christ, you cannot have the Father. You cannot have God. Unless you have Jesus Christ, that is the only time you can have the Father. But you got to be the one that will make this decision. You got to be the one that will make Jesus Christ your Lord and your Savior. No one can do it for you. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. Anyone hears my voice, opens the door, I will come in and I will eat with him and he will eat with me. Which means you are the one who's going to make this choice, this decision. Your parents, relatives and friends cannot. Because God created you as a free mortal agent. You have the right to make choices. So, he wants you to exercise that right that he's given to you to decide whether you want Jesus Christ or not. But there is a repercussion. There is a consequence for those who reject Jesus Christ. And that is hell. If you reject Jesus Christ, your eternal destination will be hell fire. That's what the Bible says. So I got to warn you ahead of time. Now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. When you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Don't say, let me go get my axe together and come and be born again. You could not. If you could, Jesus Christ would not have come and died in our place. But he will empower you and clean you and recreate your spirit as soon as you come as you are. And you will become a new creature and you have then the ability to live a better life. That's what salvation is talking about. The time is very short. Jesus is coming back very soon. What do you got to do? Do it today. Do not delay any longer. Today, about 155,000 people died in the world. Where did they go? Depends on the choice they made when they were still alive. If they choose, if they chose Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they will go to heaven. But if they did not make that decision, they will go to hell. And after your spirit leaves your body, to make that decision is too late. It becomes too late. No one could pray you out of hell. That is why you gotta make that decision today. David Speaking to Jonathan says, there is only but one step between me and death. Make that step today. That step between you and hell. Make that step Jesus Christ today. Receive him as your Lord and your Savior. You will have a lot to gain. Hell to shun. Heaven to gain. Jesus says, if you believe that I am not he, the Messiah, you will die in your sins. And he that believes not is condemned. Why is he condemned? Because he believes not in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That is why he's condemned. So I'm going to lead you now in a very short prayer. Prayer of salvation. If you pray it and you mean it with your heart, you'll be born again right now. Pray this prayer with me. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe he is your son. He died for my sins. You raised him up from the dead on the third day. Dear Jesus Christ, I ask you this day 
to come into my life and be my Lord and my Savior. I believe now that I am born again by faith. My sins are washed away by faith. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life by faith. Father God, I give you all the glory in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Welcome into the kingdom of God if you pray that prayer. Now that is another experience subsequent to salvation. We call it the infilling of the spirit of God, evident by speaking with other tongues. If you want to know more about this experience and be a partaker of it, go to my YouTube channel, Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. There is a teaching there titled, Speaking in Tongues is for Every Believer. It will help you, enlighten you, and guide you, and teach you what you need to know about this experience. Remember that you are now born again, but you are a baby Christian. You need to grow. And the only way you can grow is through the word of God. So I will advise you to find a very good church where they teach the word of God. Be a member of this church. Of this church, buy a Bible and study the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Desire the sincere make of the Word of God that you may grow thereby. Very, very important. I want to use this opportunity to thank our partners who are all over the world, those who are helping us. Spread the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ through their prayers, through their financial assistance. Those who are helping us reach more people at no cost to them. If you want to become a partner, go to our website. It is www.kuim.org. And there will be a donation button there where you can securely give your gifts to help us even reach more people for Christ. Remember that it's only those who hear the word of God and they put them in practice. They are the ones who will always benefit from the word of God. I pray today for you that the Lord Almighty will lift up his countenance and give you peace and bless your life and give you prosperity. Remember the time is very short. Be strong in your faith. For surely there is an end and your expectations will never be cut off. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Baruch Hashem Adonai. In a cascalabon, Kurotobushe, Ekerimus, Kumparante. Yanda.